Good morning, folks. I hope you guys are, going, are doing well. Thanks so much for joining us again for another Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. And today, just before we start, I have a few housekeeping to tell you so we can start and be all in synchrony here during this meeting. To start off, if you could please mute yourself during the presentations, that would be great. We wanted to avoid getting that echo that you just listen from me. And so we wanna make sure that the presenter can focus on his presentation. If you could please also go back and sign in with your first and last name. And that's pretty easy to do actually. Go to that participant list that you see, find your name and hover there and click more than rename with your first and last name. That will help folks whenever they are actually applying for the RUP credits. You can ask questions in the chat box that's the, on the bottom of your screen. And around 7.30, Phil Cates will come back and give you the RUP and the CCA codes that you need. Another thing that we wanna make sure is, we have a survey that Phil gonna put in the, in the chat box right now. And I wanted to explain you why we have that, right? MSC extension programs are open to all. The collection of, the, of demographic data from program participants is an important and mandate aspect of all MSC university programming. This is voluntary and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participate in that program. A link has been shared in the chat box. We ask you to please take the time to fill out that information. We wanted to hear from you and knowing more about you, not as a person, but as a group, can help us to develop better uh, programming with MS Extension. With that, I wanted to introduce my friend, Dr. Isan Ghani. He's gonna be talking about designing drainage system to maximize profit. Uh, Dr. Ghani, uh, he's an MSU agriculture drainage is, is, uh, specialist. Are you ready? I'm gonna be talking about drainage systems. So today, after all this rain we've had, drains are finally flowing after a period of uh, not flowing. So the topic is designing drainage systems to maximize profit. And also it's gonna be related to what, how do you design it to protect water quality as well as maximizing profits. So there's, you, you've heard about some nutrient reduction strategies. Um, there's, there's edge of field nutrient reduction strategies, IP control drainage, saturated buffer, denitrifying bioreactor, P filter, constructed wetlands, buffer strip. You've heard about some of these, I'm sure. And there's infield practices, um, diversified crops, uh, reduced tillage, and so on. There's one uh, strategy that is often is uh, overlooked, and it's not uh, even it's minimally talked about. Is this design, the drainage design? That's a strategy, believe it or not. That is a strategy. Why? Because that affects drain depth. Uh, because Drainage design uh, is comprised of drain depth and drain spacing. In that diagram here, you see, um, you see that these are the drains and the spacing between these two and the depth, which is the distance from the ground surface to the drain. That that affects. That's a strategy. That's a nutrient reduction strategy. I'm going to talk about what it means next. <clears throat> so the drainage design that is comprised of the drain depth and spacing affects water quality and crop production. That's why my title was, how do you design these drainage systems to, um, to protect water quality and also maximize profit? So let's see uh, what happens. So, <clears throat> so these drainage systems are typically designed, the spacings based on judgment. Uh, and, but what if, when you design it, what if um, you pick some a spacing that is too wide? What would happen to the drainage system and the field? So in that case, if you have too wide of drain spacings, then you're gonna have less total water drained. You're gonna have potential yield loss due to wet stress. 
and you're going to increase yearly yield variability from year to year. Your yield is going to change a lot. Um, and that's the whole purpose of a drainage system to get the water out quick enough so you can have a more very more consistent year to year yield and also do not have any damage from water. So if it's too wide, that's going to be the problem. We don't want that. What if it's too narrow and you pick something that's too narrow? Well, it's not going to affect the crop. The crop is going to be fine. It's going to take the water away from the crop, but it's going to take more total water out of the field, and that's going to increase your capital cost of the drainage system. And that's going to affect your um, reduced, it's going to affect your profitability, basically. So it's going to reduce your profitability because if you put too much money in the drainage system, you get a yield benefit onto a certain um, crop yield. It's not going to keep going up. It's going to remain consistent. I'll show you in the next slide. So you're going to lose profit. And very importantly, it's going to cause problems with water quality. That's what I talked at the beginning. Uh, this water quality is important. And if, if it's too close compared to the one that is wider, it's going to take out more nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So we don't want that either. But if it's something in between that it's closer to the optimum, meaning that the best scenario that can give you the best yield with the lowest cost, then you're gonna take out that amount of water that's necessary for crop production. And that's gonna be what the spacing that's gonna maximize economic return on investment. And it's gonna help protect water quality. Why? Because it's not gonna be the too narrow scenario. Um, your, your goal would be in that crop production area Plus, you're not going to be too narrow, uh, narrower than necessary. So that's the check mark there. That's what we want to be close to. So the drain spacing tool, we have a tool. I'll demonstrate it briefly. This tool estimates. So this tool, basically, if you've gone to the, um, if you've attended our drainage school, in Michigan, we have a drainage school. Other states have it. Uh, we talked about the we talk about the drainage coefficient, which is the depth of water removed by the design drainage system in 24 hours. It's in inches per day. Um, so basically, the tool maximizes that, and then it um, it then it calculates that spacing off of that drainage coefficient that the tool provides. This is. Um, so this <clears throat> graph here is an example of what this would do. You can see here that so we have um, th this graph here on the left axis. I've got the relative yield in percent. Hundred percent means your maximum potential yield has been achieved. The one on, the, uh, on this axis here, I got zero to 350. That's the uh, drain spacing in feet. And then on the right axis, I've got average annual return on investment. That's in dollars per acre. Zero means that you just balance out. You're not making profit. It's just, but if, you, if you're in a positive, it's a good thing. So let me show you the, uh, this is an example as what the tool is, has been based on. So the Drummer City Clay Loam Soil in Urbana, Illinois. And this is the crop yield. So see how, um, as you increase your spacing, the crop yield uh, goes down. Remember I said that that's gonna cause water stress in the previous graph? That's where this graph is showing. And then remember I said that if you keep you're making it narrower, it's not gonna make your yield go higher. See that? So about this area, uh, here, and if you keep making narrower and narrower, and, and this, if this line continues, it's probably just going to keep continuing about the same, about. So it, there's no, um, it's not economical to go too narrow. It's just going to be uh, causing a lot of nutrient loss. So this is the crop, but then let me show you the profit. Look at how the profit changes. So the profit at the beginning, because it goes up, it peaks, and then it comes down again. So basically the tool goes to the peak of that. And in this case, 44 feet is gonna be maximizing the profit. Yes, it will. Even though 
at 44 feet, it's not the maximum, but it's very close. It's like half a percent or 1% um, difference between here. But that's economically speaking, that would be the best case scenario. <clears throat> so let me show you. Uh, so if you go to the, so if you go to the drain this website, I will, if Ricardo, could you paste this? This is a simple address. If you could, after the, um, after I present, you can, we can put this in the chat box. Sure. Yeah, it's on. I I actually already I I already put a link in the chat box for folks oh. for the drainage two calculator. Awesome. But I can put that. Yeah. So we're good. So um, this is the drainage website, drainage tools, drainage design tools. The first one. We have a suite of these tools. The the state of the art, the the most advanced one. I'm I'm proud of. I'm proud of all of them. This one is the really, really useful one, the drain spacing tool. So if I click on it, um, you will go to the tool and this is what the tool interface looks like. It's a GIS interface, you zoom into your, I'm gonna do a simple demonstration. Um, so you go to a simple, um, you zoom in to any, any location you like, let's say like this farm, I'm randomly just going here and then if you, draw a boundary around your area, you could pick your shape if it's like a polygon. And I'm just gonna, and then double click. And then this is, and then uh, if you enter your target corn planting date for this, for your region, for this part of Michigan, May 5th would be my choice uh, based on, um, so this would be May 5th, would be the target planting date for this date. And one thing here is the drain depth. And if you click on calculate, it will provide you with, the, um, with, the, with an output. So <clears throat> currently uh, MSU recently just started um, up doing some changes to their servers. So the tool calculate is not working. So MSU is working on fixing those. They, it was working before they started making changes. But I, uh, I'm prepared. I have a screenshot of what the output looks like here. So uh, this is what the output looks like. It's going to show you optimum drain spacing. It's going to show you design drainage coefficient and so on. But the first one basically it says it's 50 feet. And um, this is your optimum drain spacing. And within that tool, you will have access to a user manual extension bulletin that we just published, I think just a week or two weeks ago. This is recent. So if you click on this, you'll be taken to a PDF file um, with the extension bulletin to read more about this. And video tutorial is there too. Um, I, I only have time to give you a dem brief demonstration that I, and I, as I have here. So the output would just look exactly like this. If you want to learn more about this tool, you, I encourage you to go to the website again, the drainage extension website. Here we got two upcoming events. The first one is the drainage tools workshop, uh, where we're going to actually get into more depth details about this and about this. This is a free virtual workshop, this one coming up August. There's another one, if you're interested, this is the drainage design workshop. This is very, um, in, uh, this is a demanding um, workshop. It happens, we, all, we could not have, have hold this in 2021, but it's gonna be in March 8th to 10th of 2022. We have hands-on, it's gonna be in-person uh, discussions about how to design drainage systems. Thank you so much. Son, thanks so much for your presentation. Appreciate that. Uh, son, I have one first question from Phil Cates, actually. And it's actually a very good question here. How do you calculate the economics for the drain space? Yield, crop price, cost of tile, and land costs, they change pretty much every year. That's a good question, Phil. Um, <clears throat> so I entered the, into a chat, too. So the economics of the tool, it considers three components for the economics. First, number one, it considers the annual corn production cost. 
uh, and that includes the direct and the indirect and uh, the economics of that. Two, it includes the average annual drainage system cost. That's the drain tile material and the contractor fee, the, the actual installation cost. That's two. Three, it considers the average annual corn production income. That's where you make, uh, you get crop production from the drainage system. And then that's where you get the, um, the price of corn of that time gets into account in that system. So I, I, I only went through the basic version of the tool. In the actual workshop, the free workshop coming on August 24th, we're going to go into the advanced section too. Generally, the tool, the basic version, um, is only requires, I think, like, like two inputs, the drain depth and the target compounding net. But the advanced one gets into the uh, details of the corn. So if you can enter your own corn price of your of the time and your drainage system cost because those affect this tool because it's an economic tool right but if you go into the advanced then you can enter those and put your tile company uh, tile um, material cost installation cost and that gets into considers into that so uh, thanks so much and actually we have a, a follow-up question from leon cook here asking how much of the estate's covered with the information you showed in the drainage tool? Yeah, good question, Leon. Sorry, the tool didn't work. Uh, it's really, um, if you heard about ransomware attacks these days, I think uh, um, maybe, I don't know if we were attacked or not, but uh, the tool was working and all of a sudden with all of this ransomware attacks with cyberware attacks these days, security levels want to go up, MSU, has done some things and it's not working, but it, when it works, it works for the entire Midwest, uh, beyond Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, and all the way to um, North Dakota. So it works for entire Midwest. And uh, like, so the, two, the one message that I would have for the tool is that use the tool as a general guide, use it as a guide to help you where you would be in your drain spacing. If you want a better, uh, output from the tool because any tool, any model is, is as good as its input. But if you want to make it better, go into the details, those advanced settings and enter your own verified. So you have a verified uh, soil property, you have a verified corn, you know this is what you want to do and then you get a better output. Make sure to fine tune, right, uh, the tool uh, because probably uh, the tool is not perfect. They just give you the guidance what you do, right? And you are responsible for fine tuning that. Exactly. Fine tune or tailor the tool to your own custom conditions. Isan, uh, thanks so much. Jeff, I know that you already answered the question from Phil, but you want to maybe just say out loud for folks that are not reading there. The question was, what is the nine day outlook look like? Right. And, and it's, it's sort of a it's almost a trick question because uh, this outlook, the 90 day that we get officially from from NOAA, and uh, the Climate Prediction Center comes, uh, it comes out during some point during the third week. Today is that day, but it's not available until 8.30 this morning. But that said, the current outlook, which is last month's issuance, is for warmer than normal mean temperatures, and that would be July through September, uh, with no direction on preset. But again, the pattern that you saw in some of this with drier than normal conditions forecast to our west and wetter than normal conditions forecast to our east and south, that, that has been persistent as has the warmer than normal forecast, I would be a little surprised if the new outlook, the updated one that comes out here in another hour is very different from that. So uh, the warmer than normal, I think is a good bet. All right, uh, Jeff, uh, thanks so much. I, I know that Marty, he left uh, like a message here in the chat. So I don't know if Marty is on, but just in case I'm gonna just read that out loud, Marty, and you can just join us. Oh, are you there? So do you want to tell people what Chris said and also maybe just jump on your own uh, message that you left right below? Sure. Good morning. So, yeah, Chris Defonso is driving this morning. She wasn't sure if she'd be able to um, talk on the on the breakfast call. So she just wanted to draw attention that Western Bend cutworm flights are up pretty dramatically. Um, so it's important to get out and scout this last week of July. Um, and the threshold for that is 5% of plants with egg masses. Um, the thing that relates to the pathology side of things too is that at the moment we're at pretty high risk for uh, Fusarium ear mold infection, uh, just given these wet and humid conditions that we've had. 
Um, hopefully, as Jeff pointed out, you know, things will dry up a bit and that'll reduce that risk. But that these wet conditions will favour infection through the silk channels, right, for the fungus. Um, and, and on the western bean cutworm, it's related just in terms of that physical damage that the western bean cutworm creates to the ear uh, can lead to entry of uh, fusarium for sort of more of a localised uh, infection and then, you know, increase in, in vomitoxin accumulation there too. Mark, uh, thanks so much. Appreciate that. And Clay, he left a very nice comment there saying that today is the deadline to report your spring crops, okay? So make sure to do that if you haven't done yet. Thanks so much, Clay. Um, so uh, Paul is asking, I, I think that Dennis is on, Dennis Pennington. He, if he could comment on the wheat harvest uh, progress and also on the grain quality. I think I saw Dennis here just making sure that he's ready. Yeah, sure, Ricardo. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, wheat harvest is kind of stalled out with this rain that we've had. Um, you know, the rain has been sporadic across the state, so there was a few areas that ran over the weekend, um, but it hasn't been much going on here since uh, about Sunday, I think, in terms of uh, uh, wheat harvest. But uh, I, I would guess that we're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 60 percent harvested across the state. In terms of quality, we've got in the white wheat growing areas, we've got falling number problems, and that number just seems to, it started out bad, and then it got better um, for some of the later maturing uh, wheat, uh, but now with the rainfall we've had frequently recently, um, that number may start ticking back down again, um, and then, but as far as vomitoxin, we really have bet very low levels or I mean, they can detect some, but it's it's not even anywhere near where you get docked. So from a uh, vomitoxin level, it's been really good. But the, the sprout has been the key issue. And to the, some point, even where there's been some elevators that are just telling everybody that you bring me wheat, it's going to be graded as feed grade uh, wheat, which um, there's a little bit of concern about that because, you know, they need to test each load of wheat uh, rather than just blanket statement that it's, it's feed grade wheat. So... Um, I would say get your wheat harvested just as early as you possibly can. Even if it's a little bit wet, I think uh, you might be better off to pay a little bit of drying cost um, to save, you know, the risk of, of having sprout damage. And red wheat can sprout. It typically does not, it's not as conducive for sprout as what white wheat does, but there are some varieties of red wheat that can sprout. So um, we do have uh, pre-harvest sprout ratings in our variety trials. If you go to varietytrials.msu.edu, click on the wheat one and uh, open up the variety trials. You can see every variety in our testing program and what the sprout rating is. So, um, yeah, I'd say keep plugging away as hard as you can. Try to get that wheat out of the field just as quickly as you can. Dennis, uh, thanks so much for the report. Um, I just got another question here. Uh, to Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, we, we 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 have a window to wrap up with harvest them. I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat? I didn't yeah, quite catch uh, it. So Paul is asking if we're going to have a window to finish a wheat harvest. Oh, uh, actually, that's a that's a good point, especially given what what Dennis just reported. This this period we have coming up this week, starting this uh, weekend and into next week, should be pretty favorable uh, to get uh, to get things done or at least dried out really quickly especially in the northern part of the state that's uh, I, I there's probably no no precip anywhere on the forecast until the end of next week or late next week at, at the earliest and as I said we'll also have an uh, above normal temperature so things will will change pretty rapidly here after this current rain is over in the next uh, 20 well at least in the northern part of the state so I think it is. Uh, it, it does look like maybe a nice opportunity for that. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so a few Kate's just shared that uh, Western bean uh, cutworm counts are average in around 25 to 30 for trap. And he also shared like a link where you can see uh, the numbers for the state. Um, Ricardo, this is, yeah. uh, this is Chris here. I, I have pulled over. And I, I just want to tell people to follow up on what Marty said. You know, he's talking about ear, 
ear mold risk and there will be a, a particular time frame that you'd have to get fungicides on and i know then people will put an insecticide in there uh, you really, I, and I think Marty will agree with me that the timing of that mixture should be date should be based on the fungicide, because if you miss that timing, then the fungicide isn't useful. So your insecticide in that mixture will probably be a little bit early. So it wouldn't surprise me if you put on a tank mix. Maybe you take care of the ear mold problem or reduce that, but you may seem see some slip through with some of the. Uh, larvae that hatch a little later so i just want to make clear that in in a in a tank mix and again Mar marty can comment then too what he thinks but i i think you should time it on the on the ear mold risk or on the uh on on the silks and and less so on what's there for the for the uh eggs yeah chris um yeah i agree um so it's if we're trying to reduce ear molds with a fungicide application, it's really got to occur during silking. Um, you know, once we go out pre or post that sort of window, then efficacy drops off significantly. Um, in terms of efficacy, I mean, don't expect miracles, right? Um, we see much better control of head scab in wheat with fungicides than we do ear mold in corn. The, the ear mold in corn tends to be fairly variable um, in terms of efficacy of control, we, we do see reduction in vomitoxin levels, but it just doesn't tend to be as great as it is in wheat and just a little bit more variable. Yeah, and then, and then if you get the timing wrong, then it's even worse. The, then it's just, it's like putting the fungicide on and it's a wasted, it's a wasted application at that point. And, you, and, and then at that point, you probably should have just sprayed with insecticide alone if you had critters there, you know, maybe a week or two later. So just be really cautious with these tank mixes. I know you're all going to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I would time it based on Marty and less on me at that, at that point then. And I guess because, the other, because um, fungicide's probably more, more pricey anyway than the junky insecticide that you're throwing there. So. Yeah. The only other opportunity that's sort of there, um, in cases where there is tar spot really picking up, then, you know, if you're not in that silking window, you're not going to control the, the ear molds. But, you know, later season um, after silking, then we might have an opportunity to try and um, suppress tar spot. Um, and, it, you know, in terms of managing that, we've, we, we need to really be managing, you know, a 60 plus day window here. And fungicides work for about two weeks. They knock down the amount of disease and, um, you know, help protect for about two weeks, but then after that, you know, tar spot can pick up again. So uh, it's about knowing what's in your field, knowing the local um, conditions in terms of disease presence or not. Marty, I have a question on that. So if we have corn fields that are just starting to tassel right now, and we have a weather forecast that says the next 10 days are going to be hotter and drier than normal, is does that really... Is that where the farmers need to be is to apply a fungicide application now? Or what is the risk going to do with these temperatures and, and uh, less moisture coming up? Right. Are you talking about tar spot specifically, Phil? Or? <laughs> I'm talking about corn. So I, it I, depends what you're trying to manage, right? What has been your history? Have you, have you always struggled with ear mold? Then, okay, I mean, maybe you want to be, you know, trying to manage that. Um, Tar spot, where are you in the state? You know, is, is there areas of fields that have a pretty significant tar spot in your area um, and get out and scout and are you seeing tar spot? Then yeah, okay, maybe you think to manage that. Certainly those dry conditions will slow development of tar spot. Absolutely. Um, again, it's sort of about, you know, trying to maximize um, efficacy, I guess. Um, I mean, I, ideally, you probably want to wait until you're seeing some some level of tar spot. A very, you know, you don't want to let it get get away on you because then that's going to be a really big problem. But um, going too early could be a bit of an issue. So last year, in some, and we'll talk about this in more detail next week. But last year, um, in an irrigated location that has very high risk, susceptible hybrid, we sprayed on the 
17th of July, and we protected between 30 and 50 bushels, depending on the product we put on. But it was a location that developed very heavy tar spot. Um, again, it was irrigated, so higher risk. Um, but it just really depends how the rest of the season plays out, right? If the, if the rain's going to come back in August, and if so, then that's going to kick up disease. Well, uh, uh, thank you again, Marty. Uh, I see a few other colleagues here uh, on. Is there anything you guys wanted to share before we end our conversation for this Thursday? I know that we have Paul, we have Eric. Is there anything that you guys want to share from your area? Well, it's a period. We are all quiet here today. Phil, I think we are. I think we are good. Do you have anything else to share so we can finish today? No, th no, sir. I think we're all set. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today, and we're looking forward to see you again next th Thursday when Marty will be talking about Tari Spot. Right? Thank you guys so much, and you guys have a great day.